In the last 10 years, we've seen this man rise up from the streets to the pulpit. In 10 years' time, God has been using him and anointing him to bring forth the word of God. So, Brother Wayne, preach to us. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Did you all have a good Thanksgiving? I actually celebrated it twice, so it's showing. <laughs> Amen. You know, it, it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you, Pastor, for um, releasing your pulpit to me. It's just, just I'm in awe. I, you know, I want to cry sometimes when I see what God's doing in my life. And sometimes I do because he's brought me a long way. And uh, it's at the cafe, I preach the same time every week. It's tough here because once a year I'll come, i got to preach a short message and then a long message. So bear with me as I, as I prepare to do this. Um, Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you just push me aside, Lord, as I make myself available for you, Lord, Father God, use me, use this vessel, Lord, that you've put back together to bring a word that you put on my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, I'm going to be a, a grandparent in about four weeks. I can't wait. I cannot wait. My sister's a year and a half older than me. And she's about to be a great grandmother. And it's like, I, my father's going to be a great, great grandfather. And it's like, wow, that's just blowing me away. Blowing me away. You know, it's Missions Month here at NLC. And the pastor said part of my message uh, or my introduction was going to be, you know, why me? Why am I up here? But it, pretty much you said, you said it. We do, we minister all around the world. Our giving goes all around the world from this church, 38, 38 different missionaries and, and missions that we donate to. That's on top of all the money you talked about as well. It's another $22,000 on top of all that that he didn't even mention that gets pledged every year. And uh, all around the world we go to. But, you know, I want to bring it a little closer to home today, a lot closer to home right here in Haverhill, Massachusetts, is a missions field. You wouldn't know it driving your car every day to work or wherever or going to Market Basket or Stop and Shop or wherever you go to the stores or, or anywhere, but there is a big missions field right here in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Every Sunday, I'm blessed to preach God's word to the homeless or those living in shelters or subsidized housing, drug addicts, many who are just down on their luck if you call it luck. I don't believe in that word anymore, but I didn't know what else to use. But they're ordinary people, just like you and I. Just situations have, have caused them to be where they are. And that's something I, I'm realizing as I preach at the cafe, you know. I used to be prejudiced and, and call people that were homeless bums. That's just the way I was. Then God opened my eyes and he opened my heart. They're normal people. I get amazed over and over as I hear people tell me they sleep in clothing bins. Right here in Haverhill. Dumpsters. Under the bridge in the Merrimack River. In tents in the woods. Cars and trucks in, in, in their parents' yard because they won't let them sleep in the house. Street corners. Anywhere they can. Open grates where the hot air is coming up in the cities. And there's some of them here in Haverhill. People sleep on them. It's amazing. Right here in Haverhill. They rummage through dumpsters to get their next meal, some of them. I'm not talking about the missions trip I went on to Haiti a few years ago. I'm talking about here in Haverhill, Massachusetts. There's food pantries and drop-in centers that are open 24-7, but they aren't open 24-7. And people need help right here in Haverhill. The shelters are overcrowded. I hear it all the time. The people who are allowed to go into the shelters are allowed one little backpack with all their belongings in a little 20 by 10 backpack. You can't bring anything else in but what's in that backpack and the clothes on your back. I can't even imagine that. A lot of these people have turned away from God because of the situation they're in. And I've been like that. And my mother died. I blamed God. Or, because, or they don't know God at all. I never knew him to begin with, a lot of the people that come into the cafe. Yeah, there's a huge need, all right, for missions here in Haverhill. The cafe is just one little street corner ministry in the city. That's why I'm up here preaching today. A 
I'm just looking at the time, so bear with me, please. You know, why do I preach at the cafe? After a life of drug addiction for many years, breaking every one of God's commands, robbing hotels and stores to get drug money, stealing from my family, going to state prison, county jail, 13 secular programs, then I went to Teen Challenge and finally a Christian program as well as Teen Challenge, a part of his wheel in North Carolina, where I met Jesus face to face and something supernatural happened inside me and changed my life. I can't explain it. It's supernatural. My mind can't go there. I haven't used drugs since. It's been nine years. Praise God. Praise God. God called me to be a preacher in Teen Challenge. All the ministers down there kept saying, you're going to be a preacher, you're going to be a preacher. And I ran from it. No way. No way. Don't run from God. Because he will chase you down and he will tackle you. Uh, I don't care what team you root for. He will come after you and he will tackle you. And that's what he did. You know, uh, I was doing all these things, robbing, stealing, cheating. I'm going to church three or four times a week. But I was so far from God, it wasn't even funny. Just sitting here doesn't get it right with God. He wants your heart. He wants to take your sin and take it away from you. And cleanse you and change you. But after I met Jesus face to face and my life changed, I told him I would do whatever he wanted me to do. Preach the word. I'll do it. And uh, here I am at the cafe. It's like my fourth or fifth year now preaching at the cafe. And I thank God for it. Amen. Could you open your Bibles and, and stand up, please, as we read out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 6. I think James has it on the thing. He can put it up there. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's awesome. I love that, that scripture. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they called to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go tell this people. Father God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that it will go forth and do what you've called it to do, and it will not come back void because your word says it won't, Lord. We just thank you for your word, Father God, and we thank you for the power that's in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. You know, quickly, uh, I'm going to move on through this, but God told the message, go tell this people. Israel was so corrupt and disobedient to God at this point, he didn't even call them his people anymore. Go tell this people. They're not even, he didn't even say, go tell my people. You know? Sometimes we need to hear a message from God that we don't want to hear, but we need to hear it anyway. Well, good news. I'm not going to preach that message today. Amen? The title of my message is, Will You Go For Me? And there's three things we must do to prepare ourselves. There's probably more, but three things I'm going to talk to you about today. About going for God. Will you go for me? God's asking all of us today. Will you go for me? Will you? The first thing we must do is humble ourselves before God. In, the, in Isaiah 6 verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe to me! I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eye has seen the king, 
the Lord Almighty. Isaiah was a sinner just like you and I. He thought he was in the wrong place at the wrong time because he saw the Lord, and you weren't supposed to see the Lord. No one can see him and live. That's what he grew up with. You can't see God face to face and survive. Woe is me. I saw something I shouldn't have seen. I'm a sinner. I shouldn't have seen this. We, like Isaiah, though, must recognize that we're sinners, and we can't stand alone in the presence of God. That's what he saw, and he realized, I can't stand here. I can't be here in his presence. I, woe is me. I'm doomed. Isaiah saw God seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. Try to picture that. Just try to picture that in your mind. I love that song when we sing that song. He saw him face to face. Then he hears the seraphs call to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The doorposts and thresholds start shaking and the whole place fills with smoke. Whoa, what am I doing here? I'm doomed. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to see this. I quiver at the thought of that, but I'm in awe at the same time, just to be in God's presence like that. We must approach the throne of God with the same humility that Isaiah did. Woe is me, I'm in your presence. I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. I'm not supposed to be here. But then, Thanks be to Jesus Christ, we can approach the throne of God today, amen? He's given us a way to approach the throne. And I thank God for that. But see, but God, I love that when everyone says that, pastors say that all the time, but God, and today I can say it, but God. In his great mercy, he saw Isaiah's heart. He saw his humbleness in his presence, and he forgave Isaiah of his sins. And then as soon as the Lord cleansed Isaiah of his sin, he said, who shall go for me? See, God didn't wait around. The seraph flew to Isaiah with the coal, the hot coal, and touched his lips and said, your, your sin's been atoned for. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You can be in God's presence now. God doesn't see it anymore. And God didn't hesitate to ask, who shall go for me? See, he wanted Isaiah while he was still humble, while he was still useful. He hadn't cooled off yet like some Christians do. He was still on fire. He was willing to go. Right when asked, too. He didn't hesitate. I hesitated and I paid the price. Big time. He didn't even think about it. He just said, send me, I'll go. When just five minutes earlier, he's saying, woe is me for even being in your presence. But he knew he was cleansed. And he knew God had changed him. You know, when I rejected God and, and being, and I didn't reject God, but I rejected being a pastor when I was in Teen Challenge. When I left there, the enemy followed me everywhere I went because I was running from God. I went back to my old ways. I went back to drugs. I went back to stealing, cheating. You know, a lot of people say, well, God caused that to happen in your life so that he can bring you back. God didn't cause me to sin. I chose to. God doesn't cause anyone to sin. It's in the Bible. By my own evil desires, I was dragged away and enticed. That's what the book of James says. Didn't say God dragged you away and enticed you to make you better. But see, my God allowed those things to uh, use those things to make me who I am today. He used my bad choices to make me into who I am today. But it was my choices. I chose the path I was on. And my failures and disobedience. I had another agenda and that was not to preach God's word. It was to keep living in sin, but to go to church at the same time. And I did that for years. 25 years I did that. 
Once I finally humbled myself in his presence, I said, woe to me. What am I doing? What have I done? I'm in his presence, down at Teen Challenge. I was in Jesus' presence face to face. Out of body experience. My life hasn't been the same since. Here I am, send me. I'll go preach now. I'm not running from you no more. It's taken a few years. But I finally stopped asking God, are you serious? Me, a drug addict, the loser, the bum? God said, that's not who you are anymore. The Bible says if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is dead. Behold, all things are made new. That's who you are. I don't see the old Wayne anymore. I see the new creation. I see Jesus when I look at you. And that has helped me because that battle was going on in my mind for years when I first started preaching. Who in the world am I? I still say it today, but it's, I know that's the enemy, you know. Allow God to touch you. Allow God to, to take that sin and cauterize it with fire. The all-consuming fire. Allow him to take your sin. Humble yourself before the Lord. Before he can use you. Because if you don't, he, he can't really use you. Because then it's just you. Because it was just me trying to help other people. There was no power behind it. There was no authority behind it. The Holy Spirit wasn't behind it. So the first thing you must do is humble yourself before the Lord like Isaiah did. Woe is me. I'm in your presence. I'm in the presence of Almighty God. Don't take it lightly when you're in God's presence. When we worship the Lord, we get into his presence. So he can give us a message to do what? To go tell people. First got to make a part of who we are, the message. Then we can go tell others. I used to just go tell others and live my life for sin. It had no authority, it had no power. People probably laughed at me. The second thing we must do is allow God to heal you and to fill you with his spirit. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, this is Isaiah, with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. What did he touch my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So when we go to God in humility, he will do that for us. But we must approach him in humility. He knows our hearts. We can come up here and fake it all we want. I did for years. God didn't take anything away from me because he saw my heart. He saw through my masks. We need to be like Isaiah. Woe is me. I'm in your presence and I'm a sinful man or a sinful woman. I'm a sinful person. And God will take that coal. He will touch your lips. He will cleanse you. Isaiah never stopped the seraph from coming up and touching him. When God wants to touch you, don't stop him. Please don't stop him. Let him allow him to touch you. Allow him to heal you. Sometimes when you're sitting in the seats and there's an altar call of something you're going through, don't stop God from moving. Come up when he's calling you, when he's tugging on your heart. Come up and let him heal you and fill you so he can use you and send you. Some of us hold on to shame and guilt for things that were done to us, for things that we've done to others. God wants to take it away from us so he can use us to help others. Many at the cafe or here at NLC have given their life to Christ, yet are still holding on to things. I, I'm a prayer person. I can't say what's said, but I hear people's prayers. I hear it down at the cafe. People are still holding on to things. I hear it in Overcomers Group. He wants to set you free so he can send you out to tell others. Because holding on to guilt and shame is sin. You're denying God what he wants to do in your life. You're saying you're not good enough. We must allow God to touch us with the coal and to heal us. You know, I woke up this morning. This finger was locked shut. It's never done it before. It was locked like that, my finger. Something's been attacking my joints for the last couple months. Arthritis, I don't know what it is. My lungs were all congested. I had a headache. My neck was stiff. But I pressed through. I had to say, Lord, heal me. 
heal me. We're singing the songs, allow um, the breath to bring life back to these bones. I don't know exactly how it went. And allow my lungs to sing. My lungs were all congested. And I just pressed through and pressed through and heal me, Lord. Touch me with the coal. Heal me so that I can deliver the message. We have to allow God to touch us with that all-consuming fire. You know, Peter denied Jesus three times. Yet Jesus restored Peter to himself when they were at that fire. Remember when uh, after Peter, Jesus resurrected, they had the fire on the, on the beach and Jesus was cooking the fish and they were out in the boat and they saw Jesus and they come up to him and, and then Jesus says, do you love me? Three times. That was to restore the three-time denial. Even Peter had to be healed again. See, sometimes some of us follow the Lord, then we fall back like Peter did. Because he even said, go tell the disciples and Peter. Because Peter didn't consider himself a disciple after he denied Jesus. Oh my, what did I do? Sometimes we feel like that. What did I do? God, did, God can't use me no more. What did I do? But he wants to heal you. He wants to touch you with the coal and fill you with his spirit. Because soon after that, Peter went out and proclaimed the very Jesus he denied to people who could have killed him. And he said, no, it's in the name of Jesus this man steals, he stands healed before you. The one you killed. Because he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't care what people said or thought about him. I remember coming here after I was clean for two years, and a woman that I knew in this church, she still goes here. I would never say her name. She's not here now. She came up to me and said, I'm just waiting for you to, f I'm waiting for you to use drugs again. Just waiting. I don't care what people say. I care what Jesus thinks. You know? You know what? I used to say that to other people, so it's, I'm not blaming her because I was just as guilty. I reaped what I sowed. You know? I used to say it in my mind. Paul did the same thing. He was touched. Boy, was he touched. Knocked to the ground by a great flash by Jesus himself. He was murdering Christians. He had letters to put him in jail. God touched him with a coal. I think he touched him with a whole campfire. <laughs> but he touched him. And he got up immediately and went and started preaching. He didn't wait. God used him while the fire was still burning. This way it don't go out. Don't wait. They were both willing to go tell us others about Jesus, no matter what people said. Because even people said, Lord, you want me to go talk to Paul? He's murdering people. He said, never mind that. Go talk to him. I forget who that was, Barnabas or... Ananias, you him, this guy that's killing people? Never mind what people say. You just do what I tell you to do. Don't worry about what people say. You get on the cafe, sometimes people come in and boy, I get it one side to the other. My job is to preach the word. God's job is to touch their hearts. That's my job, preach the word. The results come from God, not from me. Not from pastor. He preaches the word. And it's up to the Holy Spirit to let that word resonate in our hearts. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. So in other words, right here, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power, you'll be my witnesses in Haverhill, in Essex County, in Massachusetts, and through the ends of the earth. That's what God wants us to do. So we need to humble ourselves. We need to be healed and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Then we can say, when he says, who shall I send? Here I am, Lord, send me. What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to do? The third point he wants us to do is make yourselves available. In the book of Mark, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man and then says to him, go to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. He didn't go home and do nothing. He went and told them. This is what the Lord did. 
and how he had mercy on you. And all the people that he told were amazed. You have no idea what the power of the Holy Spirit can do when you tell them what God's done in your life. You might think it's nothing, but that's not your job to think. It's up to the Holy Spirit to touch that person and amaze them. I don't tell uh, things what God did to amaze anybody. I tell them to bring glory to God. He amazes the people. He didn't go home and do nothing. He did what God told him to do. He made himself available, went and told the people. You know, in Luke, it talks about uh, the ten lepers. Jesus, he, I'm sure we've all heard that story. Jesus heals ten lepers. One comes back to him. One. And the other nine go on their own way. Right? Jesus says, Has, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to praise God except this foreigner? Were not all ten touched by Jesus and all ten had a message to bring to others? But since only one came back, I'm assuming the other nine didn't tell anybody. I don't know that. It's not in the Bible, but that's what I'm assuming. Thank you. See you later. Have a nice day. I see that here. Not as much as I see it in the cafe. I see it in the cafe. I need housing, Pastor. Can you pray for me? Sure. They come in the fall week. I got housing the next day. Six months later, I haven't seen them again. I need a job. No problem. Let's pray. I got a job the next day. I didn't, while you were praying, someone came under me and gave me a job. Great. See you next week. No problem. Never see him again. Like the lepers. Thank you. See you later. I got what I wanted. Go tell people. He gave me a job. He can give you a job. Pray. It ain't go see Pastor Wayne. It's, it's pray. He'll give you a job if you need a job. He knows what you need. Don't be like the nine. Don't be like the nine. You know, men at work make fun of my Christianity. But when one's mother was rushed to the hospital last week, I took him aside and said, can I pray for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And him and I have gotten a lot closer since then. It's great. I don't worry about what people say and think anymore. I know a lot of you don't either. You know? The elevator opera. Boy, I'd love to be him. Pushing buttons in an elevator. What floor do you want to go on? 50 bucks an hour. Uh, 10. Okay, thank you. Boy, I'd love to have that job, huh? Just pushing a button in the elevator. But he comes up to me all the time and starts talking to me about Jesus because I mentioned Jesus to him. Gee, can you tease a new Christian? Wayne. I got something I want to talk to you about. So we'll go up and he'll stop the elevator. It's just me and him. And, and we'll have a Jesus party in the elevator. It's awesome. Do you do that at work? Do you do that in the streets? It's not just here. God's teaching you here so you can bring it there. Not just to go home and sit down and do nothing. He's calling you. Make yourself available. The Good Samaritan. Let's talk about them. You know, here we have a, a Levite and a priest, the higher-ups in the church. Walk right by this man who's in need. I go to church, and this is too much for me. I'll get my suit dirty and so on, my robes, my turbine, whatever they wear. I'll get it all dirty. And yet a Samaritan... I hear a duck. <laughs> oh, no, it's someone's phone. I'm like, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, I got a sense of humor. <laughs> so the Samaritan goes and helps this man. The Samaritan does. I thought it was flying around in here somewhere. <laughs> We've had bats in here. <laughs> So anyway, oh yeah, big one. So, but anyway, back on this. But the, this guy, the Samaritan goes and helps him. Here's these people that go to church, and they're these churchgoers, and they donate a lot of money, they do this, they're, they're always up in the forefront, they're always showing, hey, look at me, standing in the front, and yet they come across somebody in need, I, I can't be bothered. 
And I hope that doesn't happen here. God's called us to be that good Samaritan. Not to be religious. What's the religion? Take care of orphans and widows and people in distress. That's what religion is. Does God need you and me to do this? You know, people say no, but I, yeah, he does. That's what I look at. He does. Jesus went to heaven to be with the Father. And he says, the, I'm not coming back till the word spread to everybody. Who's going to do it? He does need us. He does need us. We can go to church three or four times a week and fail to give someone a loving word that they're in need. You know, you can minister to people. You can be in the ministry here, the coffee ministry, youth ministry, men's, women's ministry, Bible studies, um, Thrive ministry, the board, cafe ministry, the salt ministry, the bus ministry, and not do anything outside the four walls. That's not what God's called you to do. Those are the ministries that we do here, the administration ministries. But we also got to do ministries out in the street at work, at home, in the mall, in Market Basket, or wherever you shop, someone's down and out. On vacation, last two years on vacation, the very first people I saw, my wife and I are in Hawaii celebrating our 30th anniversary. And as we go to breakfast the next morning, we got there at 10 o'clock at night, and a woman next to us brings a Bible, and she's sitting there with her head down, and we started talking to her. She was going to visit her father who was dying, and we ministered with her. She was a Christian, but still we, needed, we ministered to her. We gave her encouragement. I could have sat there and said, I'm on vacation. I don't have time for this. God don't take vacations. He is the devil. So I'm going to close with this because it's, it's getting late. I know there are he many here at NLC who are doing exactly these things that I've preached on today, and it's awesome to see a church that's doing that. It is totally awesome. But there might be some who just need a little encouragement or a little touch from Jesus. Some might need a, to humble themselves before the Lord and get your sins forgiven. And I'm going to boldly ask you, if that's you, stand up. If you're the one who needs to have your sins forgiven and to be touched by the Lord, stand up. We'll say a prayer for you, if that's you. Some might just need to be healed and filled with the Holy Spirit. If that's you, stand up, please, so we can pray for you. Some might need healing. They need to be touched by that coal. They need their sin cauterized and consumed with the all-consuming fire of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, stand up. We can pray for you. Some might just need to make themselves available. And didn't know that. When I was in Teen Challenge, they told me, they said, oh, we hear a lot of people at your stands where you go out and stand in the street corners and, and minister uh, are being saved. I says, yeah, because I asked the Lord to save, to use me. And the pastor there said, no, that's not it. I just look, I wanted, I wanted to hit the guy. He said, no, that's not it. He goes, it's because you make yourself available. You can ask God to use you all day long. And when the opportunity arises, walk right by that opportunity. He goes, Wayne, you make yourself available. So if there's someone here who needs the Holy Spirit to give them the power to boldly make themselves available, or you need to make yourself available and you haven't been, stand up and we'll pray for you, please. So everybody's out here preaching God's word. That's awesome. That's awesome. No, that is. That's awesome. One standing up. God bless you. Another one standing up. God bless you. See the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's okay. That's okay. Don't be ashamed of it. God's got a message for you to give to somebody else, ladies. Whatever it is. I don't know what it is. It's between you and him. But you're proclaiming to him right now that you want to make yourselves available. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand, please?